Hi everyone, welcome back to the YouTube session of the Microbiology Crash Course. I'm Dr. Preeti Sharma and today we'll be discussing in this session about mycology. Mycology meaning we'll be talking about fungus and the different types and etiologies that are important for the exam. We'll also be taking up all the images that are important for you alongside MCQs that have been asked in the previous years. So let's start right away. Topic of the day, the much famous and especially after COVID, I think something that has taken up a lot of importance, fungus, that is mycology. Let's start right away with a question. Culture morphology is best studied by, and this happens to be a previous year question. So culture morphology is best studied by gram stain, lactophenol cotton blue, calcoflower white, and methanamine silver stains. So culture morphology, and the answer to this question is lactophenol cotton blue. So let's know what are the different uh, stains that have been mentioned over here. I've got you an entire collage of all the different stains that could come up in the exam when it is with regard to the fungus. So the first one that you see over here where all the fungal hyphae have become black in color, this is known as the GMS stain. What does GMS stand for? It stands for Gomori Methinamine Silver Stain. Repeating, Gomori methanamine silver stain. Now there's a little bit of a trick that I always tell the students that whenever there's a stain that has the word silver in it, like over here, please see, Gomori methanamine silver. So whenever there is the word silver in a stain, means you're somewhere dealing with uh, a blackish color because silver will turn black. So you can see the fungus has become black in this case. Okay, so this is the first one. Let's move on to the next one in which the fungal hyphae have become pink. So over here, this particular stain is referred to as the pass stain. So fungal hyphae are pass positive also. Coming to the third one, you see the background is very, very dark and something is becoming fluorescent. So this is referred to as the calcoflower white. Now, if you guys uh, have seen the previous sessions and the previous lectures of the microbiology crash course, all of you already know that what kind of a stain is calcoflower white. We've done a mnemonic for it. That flower will basically be for fluorescent. So calcoflower white is going to give us a fluorescent or it's going to be a fluorescent dye that will be there. Moving on to the fourth one, I can see a culture plate. So what is the culture medium on which the fungal uh, samples are grown? So the fungal media are Sabaurauds dextrose agar, SDA that is Sabaurauds dextrose agar and if I've grown it, see I've seen a whitish color, cottony whitish color colony over here. From this, if I want to grow it, take a little bit of a specimen, I want to see it under the microscope. So what am I trying to do? I am trying to look at the culture morphology. I am trying to look at the culture and what morphology does it have on the microscope. So what color stain have I used? I have used a blue color stain and that is referred to as lactophenol cotton blue and that is exactly what I had asked you. Let's repeat the question that if you want to study culture morphology, if you want to study culture morphology, you will use LPCB that is lactophenol cotton blue. Let's move on to the next one. I have two more stains in front and both of these the organism in both of them is nothing but cryptococcus. I'm sure everyone has heard about cryptococcus and it's very famous for causing meningitis. So cryptococcal meningitis is definitely a very important question in the exam. Please remember, now when you're dealing with the case of cryptococcus, what kind of samples do you think you're going to get? Number one, you might be dealing with a patient with cryptococcal meningitis. So they'll take out the CSF cerebrospinal fluid. They'll do a lumbar puncture. They'll send you the CSF sample. That's one possibility. Second person dealing with cryptococcal meningitis might die or there might be an autopsy case. So you might get a biopsy tissue. You might get a brain biopsy. These are the two samples possible. Either in a living person, you could get a CSF sample or in a case of death and autopsy, you could get a biopsy specimen. And in both the cases, the stain that I'll use for cryptococcus will be different. Now, this stain I've shown you, 
where the background gets a color and the organisms are unstained i think everyone knows this is the very famous india ink stain india ink basically is a kind of a negative stain it's a kind of a negative stain so if they ask you that you have a specimen of csf and what kind of staining would you do you would do india ink negative staining similarly if you are dealing with a biopsy specimen of cryptococcus can you see this time the cryptococcus has become rose pink in color pinkish in color because the stain that you've used is muci carmin the stain used is muci carmin so finally these are the two things that i need to remember when i'm dealing with cryptococcal meningitis repeating for csf it is india ink for biopsy it is going to be muci carmin so now i think everyone is clear let's do a very quick recap unlabeled recap so the black color one becomes gomori methenamine silver stain pink color one becomes pass fluorescent one becomes calcoflar white the culture media sabaurauds dextrose agar culture morphology lactophenol cotton blue csf sample for cryptococcus india ink and we have the biopsy sample for cryptococcus we will be having muci carmin so all said and done let's attempt a question the capsule of cryptococcus in tissues is best seen by and they've given you a picture gram stain india ink muci carmine or methenamine silver so capsule of cryptococcus see simple when it comes to cryptococcus i know that either i can get a csf sample or i can get a biopsy sample if i get a csf sample i will be staining with the india ink if i get a biopsy sample i will be staining it with muci carmine here they've told me biopsy sample they've given me the picture also of muci carmine so the answer over here becomes the muci carmine stain if i change the question the capsule of cryptococcus in csf and they've given me the picture yes that is going to be the india ink negative staining so these are stains but now that when you're talking about cryptococcus why don't you tell me that finally what is the study that helps us so this is not for answering this is for learning please remember that for cryptococcus we do lat latex agglutination test is a very famous test that is performed for the final diagnosis of crypto cocus repeating latex agglutination test for cryptococcus well having done with all of these main main stains let's move ahead with the story and go on to this which of the following is not dimorphic first i want all of you to attempt it and then definitely we can take up the discussion of this which of the following is not dimorphic so you've got a couple of organisms over here and i hope many of you've got this right the answer to this is cryptococcus neoformans is not dimorphic so first what do we understand by dimorphic or what is the meaning of the word dimorphic fungus remember the meaning of the word di means two and morphic means morphology it has two forms it basically exists in two forms and these two forms are yeast and mold so it has a yeast form which will be very tiny tiny yeast form and mold form will look something like this they will look like hyphae you can also call the mold form as the hyphae form so repeating we have two forms that a fungus can have the tiny yeast and the hyphal form that is mold remember the yeast form will be seen at a 37 degrees and the mold form will be seen at a 25 degrees and how do we learn it there's a very simple mnemonic see what does yeast um, rhyme with yeast rhymes with heat and what does mold rhyme with mold tends to rhyme with cold so remember which of them is at a higher temperature and which of them is at a lower temperature at a higher temperature yeast will be at heat 37 degrees and mold will be at cold that is a 25 degree centigrade so which are the organisms which can show this kind of a feature that is they can show the yeast form also they can show the mold form also depending on changes in temperature this is the mnemonic that you have to know the examples of dimorphic fungus are the mnemonic says body heat probably changes shape so you'll always remember that dimorphic was all to do with heat and cold so we have body heat probably changes shape what is with b b for blastomyces h for histoplasma p for two things we have penicillium marnefi and paracoxidioidomycosis c for coccidioidomycosis 
and S for sporothrix schenkai. Let's repeat body heat, B for blastomyces. Next, we have body heat, right? So, H will tell me that I'm dealing with histoplasma. Next, P has two things penicillium marnifi and paracoxidioidomycosis. C has coxidioidomycosis and S has sporothrix schenkai. Coming back to the question, which of the when is not dimorphic? So, what is the mnemonic? Body heat probably changes shape. So, blastomyces is dimorphic, not there in the options. Histoplasma is dimorphic, it's there in the options. Paracoxidioidomycosis, not there in the options. Penicillium marnifi, penicillium marnifi is also known as Tyleromyces marnifi. Coxidioidomycosis, not there in the options. Sporothrix schenkai, there in the options. So, which of them is not dimorphic? Clearly, the cryptococcus neoformans is not dimorphic. I hope everyone is okay with this. Let's move forward. Done with all the dimorphic fungus. And now, let me show you all of those that I have just written out to you. So, right now, I told you body, heat, probably, probably changes shape. These are all the pictures, blastomyces, histoplasma, paracoxidio, penicillium, coxidio, sporothrix. All of them that we are going to study, but obviously one by one. So, let's start. Let's start with the first one. Body heat probably changes shape means B for blastomycosis. B for blastomycosis, also known as the North American blastomycosis, the Gilchrist disease and the Chicago disease. One more thing guys, all of them are going to have a lot of names and most of the names will be named after a continent and a part of the world. So, we obviously have to learn that but something that is going to go common in all of them is systemic involvement. Dimorphic fungi are very famous for systemic involvement means organs will be affected and one of the most common organ affected are the lungs. Lung involvement is most commonly seen. So, coming to the first one, that is blastomycosis, known as North American blastomycosis, North America, so also having the Gilchrist and the Chicago disease. How do we identify it? B for blastomycosis and B looks like an 8. So, here what you see over here is a figure of 8 appearance. You see the classical figure of 8 appearance. Why do we see this figure of 8 appearance? This, for example, is the organism. This, for example, is the organism. Now, it's budding. Now, it's going to show budding. And when it will show budding, the base of the bud is very, very broad. It's a broad base. See, I'll show you the difference. If this is an organism and this kind of a bud arises, you'll say, ma'am, it's arising from a tip. It's a very narrow budding that is happening. That is not happening here. Here, you can see a proper eight is forming. The base is very, very broad. The base is very broad over here. So, I can say B for blastomycosis, B for broad-based budding. There is broad-based budding that is noted and that gives a figure of 8 appearance. Why is it black in color? Now, you all know the stains, right? Why is the color black? Because what color stain have we used? We've used gomori, methinamine, silver stain. Repeating, North American blastomycosis, Gilchrist or Chicago disease, figure of 8 appearance, B and 8 and broad-based budding all sound the same. Body heat. So, heat, next, next one that we come to, histoplasma. Now, before I start with histoplasmosis, let me tell you a trick over here. Just a small thing that you have to remember for the exam, that everything that you will have for histoplasma, Everything that I'll tell you for histoplasma will be very, very similar to tuberculosis. Means what? When I'm dealing with the case of histoplasmosis, what do you think is going to be the most common organ affected? Lung involvement is very common just like tuberculosis. Number two, what does it cause in the lungs? It causes caseating granuloma. It causes caseous necrosis. Just like tuberculosis, it causes caseous necrosis. Number three, can it result in a granuloma just like TB? Yes, it can. So, patient will come to you with similar kind of complaints that is cow and sputum and caseating granuloma, lung involvement. So, very commonly histoplasma looks like TB. Then I also know that histoplasma is also known as what? It is again what uh, a part of the world it is common in? It's common in Ohio. So, it's known as the Ohio's disease or also known as the Darling's disease. Remember, Ohio's disease or Darling's disease is histoplasmosis. I know it's a dimorphic fungus means 
yeast, heat, mold, cold, right? Do we remember that mnemonic? It has a yeast at heat means at 37 degrees and it has a mold form, mold cold, which means it has a mold form at 25 degrees. Let me see both the pictures. The yeast form is very, very tiny. When I say very tiny, I mean that it's only 2 to 4 microns. You can definitely see. First, I'll try to enlarge whatever is shown over here. Uh, see, this is one cell. What cell is this? This is the macrophage. This happens to be the macrophage. So, I'll draw the nucleus of a macrophage over here. And all of us know that macrophage is something which is very, very uh, hungry. Forever hungry, it's going to be a foodie kind of a cell. So, it will always eat up the histoplasma. You will see multiple dot-like structures inside it. So, let's see this over here. You see a huge cell over here. This huge cell is nothing but a macrophage. You see the nucleus of a macrophage over here. And apart from that, can you all see those dot, dot, dot organisms very tiny? And when I say very tiny, they are only 2 to 4 microns. The size of a yeast is only 2 to 4 microns. That, that's why it looks so tiny. Coming to the mold form. So first and foremost, what stain is this? You've used it from a culture, lacto, phenol, cotton, blue. And you will say that over here, what we can certainly see, if I can take this picture, I probably would want to show it to you as an enlarged version. If I enlarge this photo further, you will say that, ma'am, you are seeing some round structures and you see some conidia or spores coming out of it. This exactly same picture came in the previous year papers. So, we can see that there is a conidia or spore coming out of it. So, I can basically say that these are known as, what name have I given to them? The authors call them tuberculate macroconidia. The authors call it tuberculate macroconidia. So, yes, there will be tiny ones also. There will be microconidia also. But these ones that you are seeing out here are the macroconidia. So, do we have... For histoplasma, did I tell you that everything will be again sounding like TB? Like I said, the lung involvement, the necrosis, the granuloma. Can I say it has the tuberculate macroconidia that makes it again similar to TB? I hope that part is clear. So, well, having said that, that's the summary of histoplasmosis. So, remember your mnemonic, dimorphic fungus, body, heat, Probably, probably stands for the number third organism called paracoxidioidomycosis, which is known as South American blastomycosis. By now, I'm sure a little bit of confusion has already started. So, why don't we start making a simultaneous table? I think if we start doing that, we'll be in a more comfortable position at the end. So, let's make a table of all the names and all the diseases that we have to know. Let's make a common table, right? Okay, so the first one. Uh, we will go in the order body heat. So, first one we are dealing with is blastomycosis. What is the other name that we have for blastomycosis? This is known as North American blastomycosis. This was North American blastomycosis which also obviously goes by Chicago's disease and is also known as the Gilchrist disease. Moving on, body heat. So, the second one that we had was histoplasmosis. Again, histoplasma is very common in Ohio region. So, that is why they also call it the Ohio disease and it is also referred to as it is also referred to as uh, something known as uh, Darling's disease. This is a very famous previous year question regarding Darling's disease. Coming to the third one, that is paracoxidioidomycosis. That is where the confusion starts, guys. Paracoxidioidomycosis is known as South American blastomycosis. Now, in the exam, don't get confused which one is North American and which one is South American. So, obviously, uh, first you will say B and P. These are the two confusing things. So, North American, B comes first. So, you, we usually say north is above and south is below. So, in the alphabetical chain, B is above and P is below. So, if I say this is north and uh, this is south, you will say B comes first, P comes later. So, blastomycosis is North American blastomycosis. Paracoxidioidomycosis is the South American blastomycosis. And what does paracoxidioidomycosis have? It has the very, very famous two things. MNM means it has the Mickey Mouse appearance. Number one, it carries the Mickey Mouse appearance. You can very well see in the tissue, it has these spores which are looking like the ears of a Mickey Mouse. 
So number one M for Mickey Mouse appearance. Number two M for mariner wheel. So the wheel of a, a ship or the wheel of a pilot. So you can call it a pilot wheel or a mariner wheel appearance. And why is it black? Because we know that when I get a black color, the stain that I've used is the Gomori methylamine silver. So repeating, paracoxidioidomycosis number one shows us the Mickey Mouse appearance. And number two shows us the pilot wheel or the mariner's wheel appearance. So body, heat, probably. Remember with P there was one more thing and that was Penicillium marnifi which I told you is also known as the Tallaromyces marnifi. So that's the other name. It is also known as Tallaromyces marnifi and the question that you get, the question that you get in this case is the natural reservoir. What is the natural reservoir of Penicillium marnifi or Tallaromyces marnifi are going to be the bamboo rats. They are going to be the bamboo rats. So now let's see what does this picture show us. So again, why is it blue in color? Because I know that whenever I'm dealing with culture morphology, we are dealing with a stain called lactophenol cotton blue. And can we see that the conidia have given an appearance of a brush? We call it a broom or a brush appearance. We call it a broom or a brush appearance. So please remember Penicillium marnifi, we are going to uh, have a broom brush appearance. So repeating, it has a broom brush appearance with a bamboo rat as a reservoir. Broom brush with bamboo rat. So with a broom, you are going to try and make the rat run away. That is how you learn it. So broom brush appearance with bamboo rat, natural reservoir is Penicillium marnifi. Where have we reached? Body, heat, probably... Two P's done, changes shape. So C4, C4 coccidioidomycosis. I'll give you a very good way of learning coccidioidomycosis. I call it ABCD. What is ABCD in coccidioidomycosis? Number one, let's start with the D. What are the other names? Again, back to the names. This is known as desert rheumatism. So desert will mean they will give you some kind of history of a cave or a desert or a valley. So they also call it valley fever or the Arizona. Arizona desert is a very, very common history given in this case. So please remember some history that will be roaming around either a desert or a valley, these kind of histories. So it is known as desert rheumatism. When I say rheumatism, I classically understand that there is a significant involvement of joints that will occur. When I say there is valley fever, I understand that the patient is also going to have evidence of fever over here. So joint involvement, fever, desert and valley history. So D for all of that. C is going to tell me coccidioidomycosis. And what is B and A going to tell you? Barrel shaved arthrospores. When you look at it under the culture, again blue color, lactophenol cotton blue. Can you see these kind of boxes? These kind of boxes are known as barrel shaped arthrospores. It's a very famous question. So repeating for all of you once again, what is ABCD? D means it is desert rheumatism or valley fever. C for coccidioidomycosis and B and A for barrel shaped arthrospores. So body heat probably changes shape and coming to the last one that is sporotrichosis. We learn this and after this we go in for questions. So what is sporotrichosis? Why do I call it sporotrichosis? Because what is the name of the organism that we have? The name of the organism is sporotrix shenkai and this is also known as the rose gardener's disease. Now I'm going to tell you the story about a rose gardener. Everything in sporotrichosis will be revolving around the word rose and we'll also have the history of a gardener. So whenever we, they'll want to give you a history of sporotrichosis, they'll always say there's a gardener, he's working in the rose gardens and he's had a thorn prick. The thorn from the rose has basically pricked his finger or his feet. So there is a thorn prick history that is always given characteristically while roaming around in the garden okay so when it will hit him on his finger or on his toes or on his feet or hand basically i'm talking about cutaneous involvement the cutaneous lesions will develop i'll show you a picture have a look at this can you see the cutaneous lesion here then here then here then here there are multiple cutaneous lesions that are going to be there in sporotrichosis or rose gardener's disease but why is it Finger pr a thorn prick might have happened at one point, right? Maybe the thorn prick happened at this point. But then why are so many 
lesion seen because it travels along the lymphatic channels. Please remember the organism is going to show us a traveling kind of a history along the lymphatic channels. That is why I say that it is a kind of a lymphocutaneous disorder. Coming further, now let's look at the microscopy part of it. Microscopically, it shows you cigar body and asteroid body. What are these? Have a look at this photo guys in front of you. I think without a doubt you can identify that this looks like a star. So first I want to highlight this photo and tell you what exactly is seen. In the center you see a round structure. In the center over here you see a round structure. This round structure is referred to as a cigar body. It's nothing but the round yeast. It's the yeast form of the fungus. So remember this is the cigar body and around the cigar body you can see these kind of starry projections that is why this entire thing is together known as an asteroid body together it is known as an asteroid body but what is in the center of the asteroid body in the center of the asteroid body we have a cigar shaped body so in repeating in the center of the asteroid body we have a cigar shaped body and now the entire thing like this is referred to as asteroid okay now having said that you would next want to see this picture what is this picture the blue color stain lactophenol cotton blue and what disease is it rose gardener's disease so does this look like exactly a rose a flower a rose it does right so please remember in rose gardener's disease we will see rosettes of the conidia we see the presence of rosettes of conidia so coming back guys Microscopically, cigar body, we've seen it is surrounded by these pink projections, so we call it an asteroid body. On culture morphology, we see the rosettes of conidia, photos you've already seen, they look like rose, so rosettes of conidia. That is why I told you in the beginning that everything out here will be to do with the rose. Rose gardener's disease, finger prick, so cutaneous and lymphoid involvement, there is cigar asteroid bodies and there are rosettes of conidia. Well, if we've done all of these, body heat probably changes shape and I have to finish this table. The last one, there was one more thing that you had to know, the other name for coccidioidomycosis that they give to you in the exam. ABCD, remember, ABCD means this was also known as the desert rheumatism, which is also referred to as valley fever. So repeating, out of all, these are the ones for which you have to know the separate names. I hope we've revised it. Now it's time to solve a few questions. So let's start. Let's read together. We have an 18-year-old school-going student who develops fever, cough, chest pain and lymph node biopsy shows you granulomatous inflammation. So up till now in our country, in our country if I have fever in a patient, cough in a patient, chest pain and lymph node showing me granuloma, honestly the first thing that will come to my mind is tuberculosis. Then I see macrophages show oval structures measuring 2 to 4 microns and all the options given to me do not have tuberculosis. Now tell me macrophages eating a 2 to 4 micron structure. Does it remind you of this? Does it remind you of this macrophage which is eating these dot dot structures that is histoplasma? And anyway I had taught you everything about histoplasma will be similar to TB. So yes the answer to this question is histoplasmosis. Coming to the next question that you have. Question number two. A gardener who pricked her finger while working in the rose garden has developed a local pustule. I think by now you know the disease. There's a gardener and there's rose history given. There's developed a local pustule which has formed an ulcer. After cutaneous nodules, there is also involvement of local lymphatic drainage. Everything is fitting in well. Firstly, we have something called a rose garden that has been mentioned. Number two, the kind of involvement that has been mentioned is along the lymphatic channels and skin. That is lymphocutaneous. So certainly what I am talking about is going to be sporotrix shenkai or sporotrichosis. Let's move on to the next one. Cigar body is seen in, right now we studied two bodies, cigar body and asteroid body. So both of them, so I'll repeat again, the round cigar body and then you had the asteroid body, both of them were seen in Sporothrix Shenkai. Next question, let's read again. 20 year old college student who's gone for some archaeological team 
uh, as a part of the team is traveling to Arizona. I think I've got my answer here, but I'll still want to read. It. Okay, so uh, what do what does this team do? The archaeologists they basically help in finding out the ex they excavate they find out the different and the historical aspects in a particular cave. So they've gone to Arizona. They are excavating some uh, ruins out of it. And one month after returning, she has developed a flu-like illness with cough, muscle pain, and fever. X-ray also shows you lung involvement and the spores are mentioned in the picture. What kind of spores are these? I think we know that I'm dealing with the ABCD organism. D for desert, which has been mentioned. C for coccidioidomycosis. B for barrel-shaped arthrospores, which I can see. And what is the other name for coccidio or desert fever? It's the valley fever, right? The valley fever is what is mentioned over here. Indirectly, I can get another question. Same thing. If they give me the picture and they say barrel shaped arthrospores are seen in, again, always remember A, B, C, D, barrel shaped arthrospores will be seen in coccidioidomycosis. Let's move forward, move on to the next question. Okay, let's read. A girl who pricked her finger, again, this is something very similar to what I've just taught you, pricked her finger, rose bushes, local pustule, progresses to an ulcer. Several nodules develop along the local lymphatic drainage. What have they done? It's the same history. They've only changed the options to confuse you. Otherwise, it's the same history. It's the same Rose Gardner's disease. It's the same skin and lymphatic drainage involvement. So nothing should be a worry over here. They're just changing the options in every exam. Otherwise, the history is remaining the same. Okay, coming to the last question of this particular set of organisms. Which of the following pathogen isolated from the sputum specimen will show the mold growth with tuberculate macroconidia and microconidia in a culture media? What have they written over here? It's a sputum sample. All of them are dimorphic fungi. All the dimorphic fungi can show involvement of lungs. So, this much is fine. After that, they said tuberculate macroconidia. This photo we had just studied, which is the organism which is everything similar to TB? Everything similar to TB is going to be histoplasma capsulatum. So whenever you see these TB kind of similarities coming your way, definitely go in for histoplasma. Okay, now one more question. So right now, if you remember, I was talking about the last organism that I spoke about, where there are multiple kind of, uh, you know, these lesions which are after a rose prick or a thorn prick or gardener's disease. You tend to confuse that very commonly with this question. I want you to read this question very carefully. There's an H&E stain of a nodular lesion on the arm of a forest worker and that is shown in the picture. So you know what happens, you see that okay, there is skin involvement and yes, there is a kind of a forest or a gardener only given and many students end up marking sporotrichosis, but that's not the right answer. Please remember the picture also makes equal importance. What is this photo showing you? It's showing you some brown, brown color bodies. Let us zoom into those bodies because the answer to this question is chromoblastomycosis. Guys, first and foremost, chromoblastomycosis is also referred to as verrucous dermatitis. It causes verrucous dermatitis. Why? Dermatitis will tell me that there is skin involvement. Verrucous. Whenever I use the word verruca, verruca always means something like a wart. Something like a wart. So can we all see that cauliflower kind of warty lesion over there on the foot? That is what you see because these are forest workers. When they are forest workers, for obvious reasons, they are walking barefoot. So by mentioning the history of a forest worker, they are trying to tell you that the person is walking barefooted. So that is when this organism tends to enter and that is why it results in this verrucous kind of a growth. And why do you call it chromo? Because it has a color. Chromo word will always mean color, right? And can we all see what color has it got? It's got a copper kind of a pigment, right? So we call these copper penny bodies. They look like copper coins. Once upon a time when there used to be copper coins, copper penny bodies, they have been given many other names. They are known as muriform bodies. They are also known as meddler bodies and they are also known as sclerotic bodies. Unfortunately, we'll have to learn all these names because all of them come in the paper. Repeating, we have Copper penny is the easiest because they look exactly like copper coins. Medler and muriform and 
sclerotic bodies now coming back you had nodular lesion you had a forest worker and you had these brown color bodies so i think now everything is making sense we are dealing with the case of chromoblastomycosis so please remember just by looking at a forest worker please don't confuse whether you are dealing with the case of uh, you know whether you are dealing with the case of sporothrix or you are dealing with the case of chromo look at the photos the photos will tell you a lot about it okay having said this let's move on to the next question that happens to be this there is a colony of aspergillus which is shown in the image below this is the photo that is shown and you have to identify that which of the following aspergillus is put out out here so uh, first let me probably teach you then we'll come back to this question so these are the different types of aspergillus that you have to know for the exam firstly we have aspergillus fumigatus aspergillus flavus and aspergillus niger if i ask you out of these three which is sounding like a black color fumigatus flavus and niger i think everyone knows niger word refers to black so which of them will show you black colonies obviously aspergillus niger will show you black colonies undoubtedly now you're left with fumigatus and flavus fumigatus sounds like fumes that's my mnemonic it sounds like fumes and smoke so which of them is going to give you a smoky green color a smoky green color so smoke and fumes fumigatus will give you the smoky green color and flavus sounds like a flower flavus sounds like a flower and flowers are nice and bright colors like yellow and green flowers are yellow and green color so let's repeat our mnemonic niger will always be black in color flavus and flowers will always be nice yellow bright yellow green colors and fumigatus are fumes and smoke so that's going to give us a smoky green color coming back i asked you this so first analyze what photo has been given it's not bright yellow green so it's not flavus it's not a case of a uh, black color it's not totally black so it's not niger it's a classical one that comprises of smoky green color it's a smoky green color and i know smoky green means fumes so this is a case of aspergillus fumigatus repeating smoky green yellow green black you say ma'am i want to look at these under the microscope so you've done the culture on what have you done the culture we always do the culture on sda so we've done a culture on the subaurouds dextrose agar and now you want to look at them under the microscope can i say i am doing culture morphology and if i'm doing culture morphology there is a very famous stain that blue color stain that we use lactophenol cotton blue so how do i get to know that this is a case of aspergillus fumigatus first and foremost you have to see there will be a vesicle a round structure over here and over here okay so this is aspergillus fumigatus and there is going to be aspergillus flavus and there's going to be aspergillus niger i think i can easily pick out niger over here also because even on this day niger will always keep its black color the black color is not going anywhere niger's always and always going to keep that so niger keeps the black color and i think i can easily identify my main confusion always happens between fumigatus and flavus so when i say fumes now you have to look very carefully you see these dot 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 kind of conidia that are arising but do you see they are not arising from this side and this side no they are only arising from the top part of the vesicle they are only arising from the top part see over here also only from the top part not from the sides not from the sides again only from the top because guys fumes fumes and smoke will always be top fumes and smoke will always go top so please remember if the conidia only arise from the upper part of the vesicle if the conidia only arise from the upper part of the vesicle that is indicative of fumes and fumigatus whereas flavus flavus is for flower that is what we were learning right flavus is for flower so flower will have petals all around flower will have petals all around can you all appreciate you will say ma'am the origin of those conidia are from this end right up till this end every side and every circumference or part of the circumference of that vesicle is giving rise to the conidia just like a flower so maybe i'll ask you a question and then you'll be able to analyze if i say lactophenol cotton blue testing has shown which of the following and you have all the aspergillus species mentioned can you see that only the top portion is giving rise to the conidia 
only the top portion from here and here nothing is coming out only the top portion is giving rise like fumes so if i'm talking about fumes we are talking about aspergillus fumigatus let's do a recap when we talk about the cultures remember fumigatus fumes smoky green flowers flower yellow green niger will be black when i talk about lactophenol cotton blue niger is still black flavus gives you full coverage like a flower and fumigatus like fumes is only going to be along the upper part let's move on to the next question in a patient corneal scrapings so you have corneal scrapings which reveal narrow angled septate hyphae which of the following is the likely etiological agent repeating which of the following is the likely etiological agent so let's do a recap firstly eye involvement has been mentioned and the main takeaway point is this narrow angled septate hyphae so let me show you two pictures this is also a fungus and this is also a fungus and why are they looking so pink taking you back to the very first slide under what stain does the fungus look very very pink fungus looks extremely pink under the past stain so coming back this is also a past stain that i have put over here and this is also a past stain that we've put but the first one i'm calling it as mucormycosis and the second one that i'm calling it as is aspergillosis and how did i so confidently put it out like this please remember the way you write aspergillus take up say the first four alphabets out of it so when you write aspergillus remember a will tell you that it is going to have acute angled branching it is going to have an acute angle branching so when i look at the branches over here when i look at the branches over here you will say yes ma'am this is one hyphae and this is another one and look at the angle between them it's acute angle this is one this is another angle between them acute angle so whenever i'm seeing a branching i'm only seeing an acute angle coming out of it so a for acute angle and rearrange spe it sounds like septate these are all septate hyphae can you all see carefully there are lines in these hyphae there are lines that are present there are septa that are present so we have septate hyphae that is along with acute angle branching aspergillus whereas what is mucor mucor is the complete opposite if aspergillus was acute branching mucor is going to be perpendicular branching mucor is going to be perpendicular branching right perpendicular if aspergillus is septate mucor is going to be aseptate so let me prove it can you see there's no line in between it's completely smooth completely smooth are you seeing any septae not at all there are no septae that i see completely smooth so aseptate and look at the branches coming out branches are coming out at 90 degrees branches are coming out at right angles so mucor and aspergillus are complete opposites remember a for acute angle branching and spe for septate but if i just show you this picture and this picture and i say which of them is broader look at this aspergillus is very very thin and mucor is very very broad so we say mucor is motor that is how we learn it mucor is motor and r for ribbon like mucor is a motor ribbon that is how we've learned it okay mucor is a motor ribbon it is a ribbon like structure that you have so now coming back to the question they said narrow angled when i see narrow angled obviously we are talking about acute angle and when they say septate hyphae septate will tell you that we are dealing with a for at acute angle and spe for septate so means we are dealing with aspergillus and that was the final answer over here i hope everyone's got the differences between aspergillus and mucor because undoubtedly it's very very important coming to the next question the morphological feature of pneumocystis carinae infection very very important some people refer to it as pneumocystis carinae and some people refer to it as pneumocystis gerovesi so please remember they've asked you what is the morphological feature of pneumocystis carinae infection these are the four options that have been given to you and i hope you guys will be able to attempt the answer to this is option number b that is exudate intra alveolar means lung involvement exudate is present with lots and lots of plasma cells how do we learn it learn it remember the points about pneumocystis carinae that you have to know firstly please remember we call it pcp 
what is there are two meanings of pcp which you have to know number one meaning is pneumocystis carinae pneumonia means what infection does it causes cause it causes pneumonia lung involvement so pcp means pneumocystis carinae pneumonia i also call it pcp because it is a plasma cell pneumonia if someone asks you what are the main cells that you have in pneumocystis carinae you will say the main cells are plasma cells that is why guys the answer to this question was plasma cell infiltrate repeating pneumocystis carinae pneumonia also known as plasma cell pneumonia will show you lung involvement with lots and lots of plasma cells under what situation please remember under an immunocompromised situation usually they give you something like an hiv positive person or a transplantation person someone whose immunity is compromised immunocompromised number 3 the only stain it is only and only stained with what all stains cannot stain pneumocystis carinae it is only stained with this a blackish color stain i think we know the blackish color stain is gomori methenamine silver stain it is only stained with gms and what kind of an appearance does it give you so you will say in some places it's looking round right so i call it a ping pong ball appearance because it's looking round like a ping pong ball i call it a ping pong ball appearance but in some places you'll say it looks as if the ball has been crushed someone has crushed the ball so this is also referred to as the crushed ping pong ball appearance the first name given to it is crushed ping pong ball appearance then some authors say okay it's looking like a hat it's looking probably like a hat so some people say that it has a hat appearance then there's one more imagination to it they'll say some of them are like a hat and some of them are like a ball so this is also what cup and saucer appearance that's another name that is given to it it is known as the cup and saucer appearance so out of these honestly telling you the most likelihood of getting in the exam is crushed ping pong ball appearance what are the key points pneumocystis carinae pneumonia also known as plasma cell pneumonia happens in immunocompromised patients the only stain which can give it a color is gomori methenamine silver and the only appearance that is most likely to come in the exam is the crushed ping pong ball appearance i hope this question is clear to everyone Let's move on to the next question. Which of the following is used for the cultivation of rhinosporidium? Hella, Hep two, SDA, or none? Which of the following is used for the cultivation? So, first and foremost, look at the organism. What is this organism over here? Answer is D, none. But let's study about it first. This organism is rhino. Rhino means there's some kind of a nose involvement. these patients come to you with nasal polyps these patients come to you with nasal polyps so rhinosporidium what is the full name of the organism it is rhinosporidium seberi rhinosporidium seberi and rhino will tell me that it comes to us with nasal polyps so earlier actually honestly telling you that if we look at the history part of it earlier it was said to be a fungus it was said to belong to the mycology section that is why we are even today we are reading it here but now they say this has been categorized as an aquatic parasite it has been categorized as an aquatic protozoan an aquatic parasite and that is the recent update about rhinosporidium seberi now remember the clinical features i've told you patient will come to us with multiple nasal polyps and what will you see under the microscope so please remember for rhinosporidium under the microscope you will see these big big round structures and these big round structures are referred to as sporangia these are referred to as sporangia inside the sporangia you have dot 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 which basically means you are dealing with endospores so please remember sporangia are present those big structures with dot 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 spores inside it that is what you have for rhinosporidium and if they ask you how do you grow it how do you cultivate or how do you grow it please remember you cannot grow it this is one of those organisms that cannot be cultivated one very important point that will come to you in the exam please remember they will ask you that rhinosporidium seberi cannot be cultivated so let's write it down because definitely i expect this cannot be 
cultivate it so all the organ all the uh, things that are written over here what is sda sda is a culture medium you can't cultivate it hep2 and hella for those who read virology you know hep2 and hella are cell lines so they are basically used for the growth of viruses you can't grow rhinosporidium on these also you possibly cannot grow it because they say that there is uh, no aid or no mode of cultivation for this so rhinosporidium seabury done let's move on to the next question okay so here we are and let's first attempt there's a vitreous aspirate from a case of metastatic endophthalmitis which on culture shows gram positive round to oval cells 12 to 4 microns in size the aspirate on gram staining shows the presence of pseudo hyphae which of the following is the most likely etiological agent? You've got an eye involvement, endophthalmitis, and you've got something to do with uh, a gram-positive organism, pseudohyphae. Out of all of these, please remember, pseudohyphae is a very, very common thing that you see with candida. So, when I'm talking about candida, and in most of the cases, we are talking about candida albicans, candida shows you two forms. Number one, it shows you the budding form. And number two, it shows you the pseudo hyphae form and I'll draw it and I'll tell you what do I mean by that. When I say budding, for example, if this is candida, you will say there's a bud coming out of it, budding. Then if this is candida, one bud coming out from it, from here another bud is coming. So these tiny, tiny things are known as budding forms. What are pseudo hyphae? This is candida. The bud, instead of being like this, instead becomes elongated like this. From this, another bud arises, but instead of being round, that other bud is also going to be like this. Then the next bud is also going to be like this. So basically, when the budding form looks elongated like this, I call it a pseudo hyphae. It's not a true hyphae. It's just the budding form which has become very, very elongated. So remember, candida shows you budding form as well as pseudo hyphae. And when the word pseudo hyphae is written with such a gram positive history given to us, we are dealing with candida albicans. One more question that we have is that Reynolds broad phenomenon is seen with. This is a multiple choice question. Multiple answers are correct. Candida albicans, candida dubliniensis, gardenella or histoplasma. Remember both the candidas show you Reynolds broad phenomena. So what is Reynolds broad phenomena? Let's study that. What do we understand by Reynolds broad phenomena? It is known as the germ tube test, GTT. Reynolds broad phenomena is known as the germ tube test. What do you do in it? You take the candida colony which you got from the patient and you put it in serum. Serum that you've obtained maybe from human blood. So serum, 1 ml, candida colony and you keep these two things for 2 hours. After 2 hours, repeating, all that you take is serum and you take candida colony. When you will incubate them, you will see that from, if this was the candida, you will see a germ tube will originate from it. Similarly, if this is a candida, you will see a germ tube coming out of it. Remember, this is the germ tube test which will only come positive for candida albicans and candida dubliniensis. Repeating, you will see a tube coming out of it. So, repeating for you guys, Reynolds brought phenomena seen in two candidas, not the others. Only in these two candidas you see it, candida albicans and candida dubliniensis. Well, having done this, let's move on to the next question. And here you have the next one. So, identify, identify the dermatophyte based on the macroconidia shown in the image below. Identify the dermatophyte based on the macroconidia shown in the image below. For those who've read it earlier, the answer is epidermophyton. And for those who've not, please read with me once again. So what am I talking about over here? What family have I entered into? I've entered into dermatophytes. I mean that these are organisms with derma involvement. What do I mean by derma involvement? Derma involvement means hair, skin and nails. So if I first ask you this question, systemic, look at this, this will indirectly answer your query. Systemic infection is caused by all the fungi except Except what? So systemic means lung involvement, liver involvement, brain involvement, skin also could be a part of the system. So multi-system involvement. So you will say that cryptococcus, yes, cryptococcal meningitis, it involves the brain. 
all these histoplasma, paracoxidio, all these are dimorphic fungus. I have right now told you in the beginning of the session that dimorphic fungus will certainly, certainly involve multiple organs. So, what is the one that does not involve the multiple organs? Answer to that question dermatophytes because right now I said dermatophytes the name tells you that it has derma in it. So when I say dermatophytes I am involving three things primarily skin for obvious reasons number two there is hair and number three there is involvement of nail. Dermatophyte will have skin hair and nail involvement. Okay, so let us see the types of dermatophytes. You can see I've written dermatophytes and I've written these random alphabets over here. What are the names of the dermatophytes? Please get the names right. There are three dermatophytes that you have to know. TME. Do you guys know what is the full form of TME? Where do we use TME? TME is our telegram URL. Whenever you're searching for someone's telegram channel, you type TME. So TME means telegram. What is TME? T for Trichophyton, the first dermatophyte is trichophyton, M for microsporum, E for epidermophyton, E for epidermophyton. So repeating T for trichophyton, M for microsporum, E for epidermophyton and now I have to tell you, do all of them involve the skin, hair and nails? Please listen very carefully. We'll write it down once again. When I'm dealing with the case of TME means I have trichophyton. You will say ma'am this has the word tri in it. This has the word tri in it. This means this will involve the skin, the hair and the nails. All three things will be affected. What is the next one? Microsporum. Next one is microsporum and the third one is E for epidermophyton. So you will say that all of them are coming under dermatophytes. So one thing is there that skin involvement has to happen in wall. Skin involvement is going to happen in all but microsporum has skin and hair involvement and epidermophyton, epidermophyton N has skin and nail involvement in it. How do we learn it? Trichophyton has tri, all three are affected, skin, hair, nails. Micro, so now think logically, micro, what is thinner or what is smaller? Hair is thinner or nail thinner? Obviously, everyone will agree hair thinner hota hai. Hair is thinner. So, hair will be microsporum and epidermophyton ends with an N. So, this is where nail involvement will occur. So, skin is seen in all. Tri is for tri all three. Micro thinner hair and epidermophyton is N for nail. So, I hope this question is clear for all of you. And if I ask you a similar question associated with it, which of the following infects hair, skin, and nails. Everything is affected. I think you will be able to answer trichophyton. Hair, skin and nails. Let's do repeat. Trichosporum nahi tha. It's trichophyton which has skin, hair and nails. Microsporum and epidermophyton both have skin but epidermophyton ends with an N so that is skin and nails and micro thinner is hair so that is skin and hair. Coming back, how do I differentiate them? I have understood what is TME, trichophyton, microsporum, epidermophyton. I differentiate them on the basis of macroconidia as well as microconidia. What are these macro and microconidia? Can you see these big, big structures over here? These big, big structures are macroconidia. And these tiny little dots that you are seeing, obviously they are micro. So macro will be bigger, micro will be smaller. Microconidia are arranged in a descending order. This means maximum mac microconidia are seen in trichophyton, next seen in microsporum and least number are seen in epidermophyton. I'll prove that to you. Have a look at this photo. Can you see these tiny tiny dots? They are maximally seen in trichophyton. In microsporum you'll say ma'am I can only see one tiny dot and in epidermophyton, you'll say, I just can't see any tiny dots. So, they are in a descending order, decreasing order. Maximum, minimum, least. Where is the macroconidia? There's a mnemonic for that. That is PSC. That is why I told you, TME stands for telegram. And I would tell you the telegram that I 
hold an eye conduct the telegram channel which is by my name so there were a couple of you who were also asking me about the telegram channel in the previous session as to where are all these pdfs going ahead pdfs are being uploaded on the telegram channel and the name of the telegram group and telegram channel is pathology by dr preeti sharma so that's the name of the telegram channel pathology by dr preeti sharma and i think with that doubt i have also made a mnemonic and the mnemonic is tme preeti sharma channel which means psc tme psc what do i mean t m e p s c means the macroconidia will be pencil shape spindle shape club shape pencil shape spindle shape club shape c t m e can you see t pencil shape macroconidia pencil shape next one spindle shape i can see macroconidia spindle shaped last one club shaped yes i can see macroconidia club shaped why don't we look at all these things directly why don't we look at t m and e directly under these these blue color stains what are these blue color stains lactophenol cotton blue so first if i say what is the range of microconidia micro the smaller ones you will say t m e this has the maximum microconidia this has few microconidia this hardly has any microconidia see you can see in the first one in trichophyton there are maximum number of microconidia in microsporum they are lesser in number few of them are there in epidermophyton i don't see any small small structures now let's talk about the macroconidia for macroconidia there's a mnemonic p so t m e and it was p s c p for pencil shape so trichophyton shows you these pencil shaped macroconidia microsporum shows you spindle shaped macroconidia that you have and epidermophyton will show you the club shaped microconidia so if i take you back to the first question which we had attempted and i asked you that what is this so first always analyze two things micro and macro you do you see any microconidia the tiny tiny dots no they are totally not there so out of tme microconidia were maximum in this few in this and none in epidermophyton so right now i feel it is epidermophyton let me talk about the macroconidia for tme the macroconidia was psc pencil shaped no spindle shaped no club shaped yes this is definitely looking like a club so the answer to this question becomes epidermophyton these are very important dermatophytes that you have to have to know coming to the next question now i think all of you will be able to attempt all are true regarding dermatophytes except all are true regarding dermatophytes except let's go one by one they are differentiated based on macroconidia are they yes i think t m e shows you pencil shaped spindle shaped club shaped macroconidia so that is a true statement epidermophyton infects skin and nails you say epidermophyton ends with n nails yes that is correct microsporum has fusiform microconidia so microsporum what kind of microconidia spindle shape yes it's definitely spindle it looks like fus fusiform is nothing but spindle only microsporum has a fusiform macroconidia epidermophyton has abundant microconidia is that the case microconidia was maximum in trichophyton then it was little bit in microsporum and negligible in epidermophyton does it have abundant microconidia that's the false statement it has least or absent microconidia so i hope now with these mnemonics you'll easily be able to solve all of these let's come to the next tinea versicolor is caused by which of the following tinea versicolor is caused by which of the following it's a very famous image based question and the answer to this question is malassezia fur fur let me show you a picture tinea versicolor is a skin disorder repeating when we are talking about tinea versicolor the first thing that they will ask you is the organism and the organism is referred to as malassezia fur fur and malassezia fur fur is a derma problem means can you see on the trunk of the patient this is the trunk the back the shoulder the neck and you can see there are hypopigmented lesions the trunk of the patient will show you hypopigmented lesions 
when you look at it under the microscope now what kind of microscopy is this very important listen to me very carefully do you see any color to it any pink or black or blue no color to it it's colorless because this is referred to as a koh mount this is referred to as a koh mount we use a 10% koh mount so my first question to you guys is when do i know that i have to put the sample in a 10% koh mount when do i analyze that i analyze 10% koh mount when i'm using samples with keratin k for keratin k for koh when keratin is present in my sample where is keratin present you will say skin has keratin hair has keratin nail has a lot of keratin especially nail has why is the nail so thick why is it so tough it has a lot of keratin so skin hair and nails basically all derma samples all dermatology samples they have to be kept in a koh mount because the keratin will be digested the keratin will be digested which means that all of these will soften all of these will soften because the keratin will be digested by koh so i have get i get a derma sample i look at it under koh can you see there's a ball like dot 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 structure yes and then there are some lengthy lengthy lines also what is this known as some dot 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 like of structures some lengthy lines this is known as the spaghetti and meatball appearance this is referred to as the spaghetti and meatball appearance so all those dot 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 are the yeast these are all the yeast they give that meatball appearance and all these hyphae the long long structures hyphae they look like spaghetti pasta so spaghetti and meatball appearance is seen in malassezia furfur or tinea versicolor i look at it under the culture i know for the fungus i will always use sabaurauds dextrose agar sda but over here i have understood firstly what is this appearance this is referred to as the fried egg appearance it looks like fried eggs it looks like a sunny side up it looks like a fried egg appearance a fried egg appearance but if i want to fry the eggs i will always need oil if i want to fry eggs i'll always need oil to fry anything and oil in nowadays we say we should always go for healthy oils and that is olive oil so this is not a regular sda i have added something on top of it this is sda with olive oil because i found out that malassezia furfur is fat loving it is oil loving it will grow in oil so the eggs will get fried in oil that is they are fat loving lipophilic we say that malassezia furfur is lipophilic it is fat loving oil loving so what have i done i've put olive oil on top of it so i've easily learnt it that fried egg appearance to fry the eggs you need an oil so sda with olive oil will give you the fried egg appearance coming back the question was tinea versicolor is caused by what it is malassezia for for okay so having said that coming to the very last question and the much hyped question following covid with fungus is right in front of us beta 13d glucan testing is done for so the last question that we have for the fungal etiology beta 13d glucan testing is done for candida fusarium aspergillus pneumocystis all of the above before i make you attempt this question um there are two things which became very famous in covid there were two markers that became very famous remember uh, during the second wave of covid there was a big boom about black fungus yellow fungus white fungus all those random colors and names that were given that is when people got uh, familiar that okay these are the tests that are done when i want to test for fungus one test is known as beta d glucan and one test is known as galactomannan what do you do it for so please remember beta d glucan is nothing but a normal cell wall component of the fungus a normal fungus has it in its cell wall galactomannan is particularly in the aspergillus so please remember one thing galactomannan will primarily be used for aspergillus so i have called it aspergillus galactomannan beta d glucan can be used for a lot of things for candida aspergillus histoplasma fusarium dermatophytes pneumocystis gerovesi it can be used for a lot of things so what's easier you learn what will you not use beta d glucan for i will not use it or it will be negative for bmc that is how i've learned it beta d glucan testing is negative for b for blastomyces number 1 blastomyces m for mucor 
and BMC C for Cryptococcus. So please remember BMC. These are the three things for which beta D glucan will come out to be negative. Other than this, all the fungal organisms written, it will come out to be positive. Galactomannan can also be positive in a lot of other things, but I prefer using it only and only for aspergillus. So let's repeat. Beta D glucan is for all except BMC. What is BMC? Blastomyces, Mucor and Cryptococcus. Galactomannan, I prefer to keep it only and only for aspergillus. Coming back, beta 13 d glucan testing is done for, you will say ma'am it is done for all. I just had three exceptions. I just need to make sure that those exceptions are not there. What were the three exceptions? BMC, Blastomyces, it's not over there. Mucor is not over here. Cryptococcus is not over here. This means it can be done for all of these. Answer to this question, all of the above. Repeating one last time and then we end the session. Beta D glucan for all except blastomyces, mucor and crypto. Galactomannan testing is done for primarily aspergillus. Which finally gives us a rapid review and a finish to the fungal etiologies or the mycology chapter. And I hope you guys are enjoying microbiology, which usually people do not. But I hope it started to make a little bit of sense. For those who have not attended the previous lectures, remember the part 1 and part 2 of these series had general microbiology. Today we've ended up revising the fungal etiologies. And next we'll be going forward with bacteriology, parasitology and so on. So yes, hoping to see you in the next classes as well. Thank you so much guys for joining in and uh, any other feedback, most welcome. Anything you want that should be included or not in the future sessions, please do write it out to me in the comments below and I'll try to incorporate it as much as I can. Thank you so much. Study well. All the very best.